The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down toys, tools, and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David, and today we're going for a beer math, an electrocardiogram. First up, let's clear up some terminology so we all know what we're actually doing. Um, I actually had to Google the difference between an ECG and an EKG. Apparently, electrocardiogram is the English, which is ECG, but EKG is the German. I'm not going to try and pronounce it, but it's basically the same thing. But you've got to be clear, this is measuring the electronic pulses of the heart to uh, monitor what's going on. Not to be confused with an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound using Doppler shift and acoustics to measure the heart rhythm. Different thing. But this is an EKG, electrocardiogram, I think. Now, this particular one is a Burdick Eclipse 850, which hails from 1997. And I thought it would be really interesting to see how different a medical device, something that gets attached to a person, is to any other of the electronics we've looked at. Uh, I'm assuming there's going to be a lot more safeguarding, a lot more protection, uh, better segregation, probably some more resilience as well. We'll have a look when we get inside. Now this one was sort of last pat tested in 1996 or thereabouts. And it does turn on. Of course it's not going to now, is it? Bear with me, I've got a power lead. Now we can see why this one is out of service because it's broke. Even the bits that do work are a bit sketchy. Performing reliability checks, please wait. And yet <laughs> it passes and turns on. But once you get to this point, even with the quick reference up here, I can't get it to go any further. I don't know if it's as simple as the keyboard doesn't work or there's something else more fundamental, but I can't even get it to turn off at this point. This really shouldn't need saying, but it's a medical device that got sold for spares because it was broken. There is no chance of me plugging this thing into my own body just to test if it works. Not a wise move. Okay, start with... Wow, an already loose screw, that's always a good sign. Okay, there's your battery. Interesting that that's actually a PCB edge connector, not a, not a specialist plug. A nickel cadmium battery. Apparently that was the thing in 1997. Of course, these days I'm almost certain that'd be uh, lithium iron. I'm sure it shouldn't make that sound. Hmm. Now, the other thing is, of course, this is capable of monitoring live or printing the patient's uh, rhythm. There's just something cool about all of like the, <laughs> the wear and tear that comes with this being an actual product used in a medical environment. This is thermocrope paper or thermal printer paper. So there's no ink, you just heat this and the trace turns black. So for anybody that doesn't know, you can go back and look at the fax machine episode where we cover that in a bit of detail. We'll put a link up here or something. I don't really know what sort of electronics we're going to find in the main body of it though. That'll be a... <sighs> Still not a good sound, is it? Feels like these screws are actually going into brass bushings as opposed to just into plastic. It was a positive sign for quality. Again, medical device, you'd hope so. This poor thing has been unloved by someone. Oh wow, just, yeah, brass bushings on the uh, top molding, just old molding. I wonder how old this is. Yeah, 1997, so this is manufactured in the first run of this machine being on market. 1997 is an interesting year for medical devices. It's when uh, a lot of previous legislation was rolled up into new legislation like uh, ISO 14, 13485 and uh, IEC 60601. So this would have had to have jumped through a lot more hoops than even previous, recently previous technology. I had really expected this to be a membrane keyboard in the style of, you know, um, when the, the rubber membranes have got the carbon on the back or a conductive coating on the back and they press down about unexposed pads. Now this obviously hasn't, it's got uh, an encapsulated dual layer membrane keyboard. Now I would think that's probably related to infection control in medical environments. You have to make sure that everything can be cleaned, everything's inherently clean. And the fact that this is sealed away from the electronics meant that this could be disinfected if need be and you can squirt the life out of this with uh, very harsh cleaning chemicals and it wouldn't start to get inside and uh, affect any conductive components. So that's our first sign of something slightly medical based. OK, 
Okay, so there's a ribbon to the display driver for the screen and a very, very big okay. Zebra to 2.54 millimeter extended headers. That's that's a unusual combination. I would have expected the zebra stripes to have gone into a, a, a fat ribbon connector, but clearly not. Okay, let's put that to one side. I'll come back to that. So here's the thermal printer mechanism. Now, compared to things like the fax machine, sorry, I've just pulled that pin out. Compared to the fax machine, that's a really simple printer mechanism. Do you remember the fax had all those cogs, all those cams, everything to try and keep it going? I guess because this is continual printing, it's not concerned where a page starts and finishes. Um, and the pinch roller being built into the top of here that actually forces the paper in and up against the, the thermal printer head, which of course will be across the back here. So yeah, that's a that's a cool module actually. The so relative size of that compared to other thermal printers that we've already seen, and the paper handling, that's that's a really neat little unit. I'm kind of assuming for the time being, power, intelligence, <laughs> digital electronics and control. We'll try and do a bit of analysis actually see if that is the case. Interesting, you've got an expansion port on the front. Um, and a little port on the back here. Now other models of the same thing, and you can kind of see this on the back. Um, that's clearly a D9 and probably a D25. Never a good sign. So other models of, of this were available that could be connected up to external equipment and have other inputs and outputs. Now to me, it looks like that pin out there probably would have provided that maybe an extra header there that connects over here or the alternative is that this card is capable of being plugged in in other places so that pinout looks very to me similar to uh, some other equipment that uh, you can plug expansion cards into uh, the, the PXI crates the PXI range uh, it's not the right form factor, but it's a similar sort of connector. So it's probably a high speed bus that you can plug multiple cards into one big crate of equipment. I don't know that this is going to be anything in specifically designed to be an electrocardiogram or whether this is a high precision analog card that's medically rated that could be used in a number of applications. When we look at some of the hardware a little bit more directly, we'll uh, look up what it is and actually see if that is the case or not beautifully laid out PCB. All the rows for all the different inputs through. This this D15 is where you'd plug in the external leads for plugging into the patient, essentially. And uh, we've got 10 signals. They've probably got their own individual DACs. Uh, we'll be able to look up exactly what these all are. I mean, this is a multi-layer PCB, and it's just really interesting that getting the light right behind this, you can see sort of the different layers. And if you look really carefully, the very top layer of this board, all the traces run front to back. Whereas on the next layer down, you can see all the traces run horizontally left to right. Now I understand that's typical of old software. Um, when you were doing uh, automatic layouts for equipment, that horizontal vertical grid based system per layer is what early software would automatically give you. So this is a computer designed PCB layout. Oh, interesting. This, uh, this IC over here in the corner next to the expansion port is actually a SanDisk IC. And I wouldn't be surprised if that was a controller for that memory card. So yeah, there's, a, there's actually a decent amount of power on this board. Um, I guess it's uh, handling a lot of analog to digital conversion over here. And then again, you can see this massive divide in the board where you've got two very separate and they're only bridged by these couple of components up here. <laughs> One's quite clearly uh, uh, transmit and receive because they are literally rotated one over the other. So you've got what could be patient facing side over here and probably the non-patient safe equipment over here and they've separated that on the board. So yeah, that's, that's the sort of medical specific stuff that I was kind of expecting to find on a board. Back in the box, um, got some enormous earthing going on over here. Uh, you know, that's kind of four mil cable, maybe even a six, it's it's big. And that's uh, an external, and that symbol, I believe, is for a clean earth connection. So when you wheel this in the room, you can plug that into a clean earth connection. And much like the high-end audio kit we looked at, look at that 
beautiful toroidal transformer. 92 VA or roughly 92 watts depending on the power factor. Secondary 25.5 volts at 3 amps. Nice normal voltage of course. I always like this when they have like the curved edge on the PCB to, to accommodate the toroidal transformer. Weird. And I also find this is slightly weird because you've got the mains incoming voltage and the 25 volts outgoing side on the same PCB. I'm imagining that this main board has got nothing as near as high as 25 volts. The 25 volts is probably present to, um, to charge the batteries. Bearing in mind I have had this turned on very very recently and it had batteries in it which would have kept the capacitors charged even more. I'm going to treat these caps very carefully, put that straight on paper and wood. Now there's nothing else left in here other than some shielding and the earth connection. I feel like they're trying to give us as many clues as they possibly can over here. So you've got V-print, so the printer clearly works at one voltage. V-bat, so there's another battery voltage. So that connected, and I won't plug it in because I've just realised that can make a lot of things alive again. Uh, there's your incoming voltage at the 25 volts. So that presumably is controlled by linear regulators down to the correct voltages. I wouldn't be surprised. What was the voltage on this pack? 16.8 uh, volts. So it's entirely possible that the, the charging circuit actually ran at 25 volts. No, I'm not brave enough to plug it in and find out. Okay, so I've been checking up on some of the uh, some of the components on here. Now, this board is super interesting and it tells the tale of how to design something really effectively with safety in mind. So keeping to this half of the board, you've got the AMD Elan SC400 33AC. So it's a 33 megahertz system on a chip. Um, so that's that's a 32-bit processor. So you've over here, you've got some DRAM. And I've got a question about these. Now, there's like two positions that you could put the DRAM in. Uh, and it seems that the traces are slightly mixed up. Now, I feel like they've designed the PCB not knowing which final component or having the ability to have two different components on it. And depending on which one you've got supply of in that batch run, you position it slightly differently. Now, I'm not experienced with the industrial manufacture of PCBs, but that seems to be what's going on here. L let me know in the comments if that is the case um, or if it's something else. Out. Um, up in the top corner we've got a couple of SanDisk controllers. This is for an ATA controller, so this is essentially a PC card uh, memory port for storing and exporting data and sort of, you know, you've got your normal ROM, RAM, storage, um, everything going on over here. It's interesting is if we start at the external interface, which for us you might as well call the patient interface, you go through a series of analog amplifiers, high quality precision analog amplifiers, then you go through a series of op amps, then you go through uh, an analog multiplexer, and then we arrive back at some digital analog converters, and finally at a 16-bit Siemens microcontroller. So all of this, all this process here is all about high quality signals and all the way back to this microcontroller. Now these two ICs are one of only three components which bridge the gap between this side and this side of the PCB. Now, these are high frequency, high speed uh, optical isolators. Now, for anyone that doesn't know what that means, on the inside of this chip, there's essentially a little LDR and an LED or a light source. And that light is physically isolated from the electronics on the other side. So that light is pulsing, sending the signal. There is no physical path for electricity to arc across these. And you notice you've got two of the same chip the other way around. So you've got one transmit and one receive. Now these are the safety for the communication bus. The electrical connection is up here. Now I managed to work out that this was a transformer. I can't tell you, because I couldn't find the exact part whether this is a step up or step down transformer. It could be a one to one ratio. So it's purely an isolating transformer. So whatever voltage they're applying here comes out here just physically isolated because of the ceramic windings, there's no electrical conductive path between the two. Finally, that does mean that there has to be AC on this side of the board. So one of these pins coming from the power supply over here must be AC because that transformer needs AC power. These components up here are all about making the uh, power high quality in DC again to run the microcontroller. All of this is patient touching, patient facing, and has to be safe. 
everything over here can be treated otherwise like any other electrical circuit. I hope you found this an interesting one. I thought it was very interesting to see something outside of the normal sort of consumer electronics market and see what happens in industry, especially when patient safety and protecting vulnerable people is a top priority in electronics. If you've got an idea for a teardown, why not come and join us over at the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.